Welcome, Pewter Report readers and viewers, to the latest edition of the Pewter Report podcast. I'm Mark Cook, along with my boss, Mr. Scott Reynolds, who we have fingers crossed that after a week of vacation, he didn't tear his voice up and he can actually speak a little bit today. Uh, I'm guessing, Scott, since you we can see you on here, that uh, that you do have a bit of a voice. Let's let's test it out a little bit, man. Let's hear what you got. Shall we test it out? Okay. So, um, uh, if I if I look or sound like Mickey Rourke today. It's because I feel like Mickey Rourke today. Um, Vegas kicked my ass. So, uh oh, we got to get into. We, we need to get into that. We should. We should actually. We should do a whole podcast on your trip to Vegas, but we won't do that. But uh, that would be an interesting podcast. Uh, um, I don't know about that. It was a fun <laughs> trip. Don't get me wrong, but uh, not from a financial standpoint. It was. It was rough. Just oh, like my voice. So, oh, okay. So yeah. the casinos. They, you're saying Vegas did not lose once again. Vegas came Vegas out ahead. Vegas is still undefeated. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, yeah, I they, guess you could say. I guess you could say like um, Vegas is like the Dustin uh, Poirier of uh, right <laughs> of, of <laughs> destinations. U.S. cities, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm I'm kind of like Conor McGregor today. So didn't break a leg, say, but kind of felt like it. You actually sound like uh, Monty Kiffin a little bit, you know. Monty's, uh, and you do a pretty good Monty Kiffin impression, so it's not too far off right now for yeah, your Monty I impression. Do. It's the the with don't, the voice don't try right now. It, it's a little challenging. Don't so no, don't try, don't try. But um, hey, uh, glad to have you back, man. Glad you had a yes, good week of you. vacation. Hopefully, you yes. got some. Well, you didn't get any rest. You went to Vegas, and you're not supposed to get it. <laughs> if you so go to funny. Vegas and get rest, it was a total waste of a trip. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's uh, but let's talk about our title sponsor, Scott. Our yeah, good well, friends. It, 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 and, and and I'll tell you what this is this is the topic today. Who is the greatest okay. Buccaneer, right? And I mean, uh, we we've run this whole series on yes. PeterReport.com, and you can see the the top three guys there in order: Warren Sapp, Derek Brooks, and Leroy Selman. And, and Mark, you and I are the, the the appropriate ones to talk about this because we're the old timers on the staff. So true. Um, but uh, but yes, um, uh, we'll get into that. We're going to get into to the top fifteen and talk about the methodology there. Right. Uh, behind our selections and and why certain guys ranked where they did. And I'll tell you one thing, Mark. If it wasn't for this tasty little beverage right here, Celsius, mm -hmm. this is an absolute life, lifesaver. If you are going to Vegas, if you're recovering from Vegas, this is an absolute must. Uh, not just the Tropical Vibe, which is the newest flavor, and it's delicious, by the way, but just Celsius in general. Um, you know, We're going to play this, this fun little video for you all to watch. But uh, Celsius is is a prerequisite for your time in Vegas. All right, that was quick. <laughs> that was quick. Yes, I was expecting a little bit longer. But yeah. listen, Celsius Celsius has we Scott. I'm amazed at how many people that have contacted me directly, uh, DM me, sent me tweets. It's really, really caught on all over the country, not just here in Florida. And that's that's a yeah. great, exciting thing. And there's a good reason for that. I mean, that you just don't have the crash that you have with normal energy drinks. And I've told the story. I used to make me run to the store and get you those little five-hour energy shot deals you used to do yes. all the time. And I thought they were a complete waste of time because you would do a couple of them and then you would be out again. And I would have yes. to carry you to your car or call an Uber for you to get home, but not with Celsius. That's not the issue with Celsius. And you, who took a red eye from Vegas, you got yes. in tonight, I mean, this morning, like at 5.30 or 6 o'clock, right? Yes, I did. Um, and and I went to bed for a couple of hours and then woke up with the Celsius. Nice. <laughs> this is, yeah, like I said, this, this is this is prerequisite for, for any, any trips uh, coming to, from, during your stay in Las Vegas, for sure. So... Uh, and it's not just uh, for Vegas. It's also for Tampa Bay and wherever you yeah. happen to be. Um, if you want to find out where you can try Celsius, any of the flavors, I highly recommend the new Tropical Vibe, which they have at 7-Elevens. Um, uh, go to Celsius.com. Click on the store locator. Type in your address, and then all of a sudden you'll see all these grocery stores, convenience stores, health and fitness stores pop up all around you. And then you can go and try the different Celsius flavors, find the one you like. Then when you do have a couple flavors, it's going to be more than one. I mean, let's face it. But when you do find the ones you like, order them on Amazon uh, and, and buy them in bulk and save even more money. So, I think uh, I think there's some lightning players that are probably using Celsius today after that boat parade. <laughs> you missed all the excitement here. You probably saw some yeah. of it on Twitter and I social did, media. Yeah. But uh, it was a wild time. And I'm sure some of those guys, uh, they crashed and slept pretty hard last night, probably 
popped a Celsius to get up this morning yeah. as well. So anyway, but let's right. let's start talking about our. By the way, I never you went to Vegas. Did you see our buddy? Uh, did you see our buddy Nick Carter? I when didn't see Nick Carter. No, I didn't. No, no. I, I I watched the. Um, I watched the fight. I wasn't there live for it, but I, I saw, you know, Dustin Poirier from the Celsius brand, you know, do his thing out there for a second time in a row and beat Conor McGregor, which, um, you know, which was interesting. But so it, it was a good trip. Good. Um, I, I, I did see, you know, your top 10 list. And John's, we talked about this a little bit. We're not going to be too redundant because we're going to have right. our, our ma master list right. from Peter Report. But, um, but yeah, um, it was funny how, John slighted Leroy Selman, obviously, right? We talked about that um, last week. And then you slighted Mike Evans and Levante David. Where did you have them ranked? No, I had Mike Evans number 10, I believe. Okay, right. Mike was on my list. He was, wasn't was as high as, as, as John had him. And Levante David was number 11 for me, technically. He was okay. just outside the top 10. All uh, right. But I didn't have Leroy Selman at number six. Seven, come on. <laughs> That's just, true. He's only the first Hall of Famer in franchise history and the all-time yeah, sack leader. Yeah. You know, um, staving pick, off. Yeah, yeah, staving off Warren Sapp and and Leroy Selm or, and and uh, Simeon Rice. You know, as as the all-time sack leader. So that's. That's yeah, good you know, and, and it did it from a three, four DN position. I mean, it wasn't like yeah, he was just some sure. stand up edge guy. Yeah, yeah, just exactly. it's okay. We, you know, I, I tell John, listen, he's only 31 years old, Scott. I have to keep That's remembering true. that whenever I start to get angry. Yeah. Um, I, I count and, to 10 and just remember 31. Yes, and recency bias is is a real thing. It's a real yes. affliction that that uh, is gripping America. And, probably and you know what? It, 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 some of our readers, too. We've got a lot of readers who are John's yeah. age, and they don't remember these guys. And, and you and I have talked about it. We've we've yeah. written stories about older Buccaneer players, but let's be right. honest. They just don't get the reads that the most recent things do. That's true. I mean, people, yeah. people always say, hey, go catch up with this guy and let us know what he's doing. And I tell them. I'd love to, and I will, you know, from time to yeah. time. But bottom line is, uh, people want to know about now, and uh, that's the good news. However, that's the good yeah. thing about this this top list that that you did, and, yeah. and we kind of all pitched in a little bit, but um, the sure. list that you did because, um, you know, we can look at the old guys, but we can also we're also smart enough to understand that that uh, you know the franchise hasn't been good for a long time. There was a long yeah. period. There was two really big lulls in this franchise's forty six year history, right. and um, and so. Uh, you know, the last few years, obviously, some of these guys that Jason Light and his staff have brought in have moved up into this list. So let's yep. just go ahead and start. You want to count it from 15? Yep. You want to start with 15? We'll start at 15. I, I do want to say one thing real quick because this really kind of echoes what you're talking about. Chidi Ahanatu, right? A player you and I both sure. covered. Um, you know, I, I came on the scene in 95. You were in the market working for sports radio at the time. We met at one buck in your place, you know, many, many moons ago. Yep. And um, so Chidi Hanatu, we, we kind of said was was the top five, meaning mm -hmm. number five defensive end in, in Bucks franchise history. We had Simeon Re or Leroy Selman number one, Simeon Rice number two. I think we had Jason Pierre-Paul, Shaq Barrett three and four. Uh, right. Maybe those guys are flopped. I think we had Barrett third. Yeah, and, yeah uh, he had Barrett third, right? JPP fourth, and then we've got um, Chidi Hanatu fifth. You know, and. We published I published that list of all of the top five people, uh, players at all of those different positions in Bucks history in my Fab Five. And Chidi Hanatu was like really grateful to be, yeah. you know, number five on that list. Yeah. And yeah, it, I saw that and retweeted that and and appreciate the shout out from Chidi Hanatu. And you know, a lot of new Buccaneer fans have no idea, <laughs> you know, who this guy is, you know. And remember and, you remember Trevor? We used to bring up old Buccaneer players' names, and he was like, "That's not a guy. Like, that's yeah. not a real guy." You used to <laughs> yes. do that all the time. Chidi Ahanatu, yeah. not a real guy. He might have right. remembered Chidi Ahanatu a little bit yeah. or had heard that name, but there were plenty right. of them. He's like, "That's that. That's not a real name." It's like, no, yeah. it's it was a real name. Yeah, exactly. So, but uh, yeah, so here's here's the list. This is the the top fifteen Buccaneers of all time, and in uh, Peter Report's rankings. And again, this this list is something you and I kind of started, um, I want to say probably around 2010 maybe. And then every four or five years, we kind of updated. I think the last yeah. update we did was 2017. So this is a list you and I kind of came up with right? Um, a long time ago with some help from others, but basically you and I. And then just kind of refreshed it with some of these new Buccaneer players that that uh, have been in there. And, for example, um, looking at guys 
on this list, the newer players, um, such as when I say newer, um, Levante David is not is not new from an age standpoint or a uh, a Buccaneer uh, tenured standpoint, right? I mean, he was drafted yeah. in 2012, but compared to Rondé Barber, compared to Leroy yeah. Selman, he's new, right? Same with Mike Evans, 2014 draft pick. Yeah. But the thing is, back in 2017 when we did this list the first time, those two guys were outside of the top 15, I believe. Right. Um, yeah. Know, I think no, they were. Was down to 22 or something. And so four years, a lot can happen. And um, we even had Gerald McCoy a little higher. I think he was 12 the last time we did this. Right. He's fallen down to 15. So let's start there with with Gerald and 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 a little bit of methodology that goes into this list. There are there are three kind of considerations I think when it comes to ranking these players. Number one is, and this this goes back to Herm Edwards, who was the the uh, assistant head coach, defensive backs coach under Tony Dungy, and we all know Herm went on to become the Jets head coach. He's now the head coach at Arizona State. He told me that he would tell his players when they became Buccaneers and their draft picks or free agent acquisitions, whatever. It's like if you want to, you know, it's it's not just come here and collect a check and you know uh, try to win games. Make your mark on this franchise, and what that means is record book. Put your name in the record book. That's how you make your mark. And so I think that 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 goes into consideration here with this list. Did you, during your time as a Buccaneer, set personal records, right? Did you, did you affect the record book? Number two is, did you contribute to the team winning? That means playoffs. That means division championships. That means, you know, championships, uh, Super Bowl championships. Right. So it's, it's hard, right, for a player like Gerald McCoy who did not see one particular or any playoff games, right, didn't sniff the playoffs, got close a couple times really, I guess you could say. Um, they went 10 and six in the second year, but Gerald was on injured reserve for most of it. Then they got close again in 20, was it 2016, 20, yeah, 2016, I believe, right. 2017. No, 2017. Went, Wait, yeah, 20, 2016. It was Dirk's first year. First coach, year, right? yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. 17 so, was the, uh, was the hard knocks disaster of the year. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So for 2016, right. Th- then you've got, um, a nine and seven season that they almost made the, the playoffs, but didn't. So with Gerald McCoy, six-time Pro Bowl selection, right? That's the second most from a defensive tackle behind Warren Sapp. And so I think we can pretty much say Gerald McCoy is the second best defensive tackle in Tampa Bay history. The thing with the Pro Bowl, though, is is it's it's an individual award, right? Um, and and Gerald gets credit for that. He's probably a fringe, Hall, you know, a Bucks Ring of Honor guy, right? Right. But the thing is is Gerald, I believe, is fourth or fifth. I think he's fourth all-time sacks, right? He's not Warren Sapp. He's not, or I shouldn't say, he's, he's not Leroy Selman. He's not Warren Sapp. He's Simeon Rice. He's fourth on the list. So with six Pro Bowls, no playoff appearances, which, again, that's not all his fault, right? Because this, yeah. the playoffs is a team thing. But, right. you know, how much did you contribute? You know, he was not a 10 – uh, or he was not a double digit sacker, got close one time with nine and a half sacks. But Gerald was a very good player. But that's why he's he's on this list at, at number six. I'm sorry, yeah, at, I, at number at number fifteen. I, I mean uh, Yeah. And, <laughs> Where did six come from? But yeah, okay, I, you know, okay. And, and I think I think you know I think Gerald McCoy is um, you know is worthy of that. I mean, it, he took a lot of abuse from fans. He took a lot of abuse in the media to a degree, um, you know, for being a nice guy. And, and listen, Gerald was a thin-skinned guy. You and I have talked about this multiple yeah. times. I mean, he didn't like criticism. There's a reason why Peter Report is still blocked by Gerald McCoy. Just didn't <laughs> like some of the things that we've said. He's blocked us, unblocked us, blocked us uh, multiple times. I think we're currently still on the block status, but, uh, yeah. you know, he was a really talented football player. We know that. I mean, the one thing that I respect as much about anything about Gerald McCoy is his ability to come back from those two injuries, two out of the first, what, three years he tore yes. the biceps on both arms. And I'm telling you, there are guys who that's it for their career, particularly at a position like defensive tackle. 
where you've right. got to hold up. You've got to be stout. You know that guys are going to be coming after you, and you've got to try and help your guys behind you, like a Levante David, like some of the other linebackers that have yep. been here. And uh, and and he didn't have that injury again. He came back from both of those, didn't get discouraged, and still performed at a high level. So I've got a lot of respect for Gerald McCoy in that sense. I think uh, I think Gerald, Gerald gets a bit of a bum rap. I think as time goes on, I think some of that goes away. And, and right. there is a point where – Gerald McCoy is a ring of honor guy. Now, I don't know if that's 10 years from now, five years from now, or 20 years from now, but eventually he's probably a ring of honor guy for, for right. this organization. Well, I think the thing with Gerald is, is because he did not play on a playoff team and certainly didn't win a Super Bowl, right? Right. I, I think the 2020 season with the Bucks Super Bowl success really pushes Gerald down. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Le Levante gets in before him. Mike Evans certainly gets in before yeah. him, right? Yeah. I mean, so you know what I'm saying? It's like, Right. Two years ago, Gerald was almost like a borderline shoe-in, right? Sure. N now it's like, <laughs> you know, uh, I think Tom Brady gets in before him, right? We have Tom Brady have, have him on the list. So let's let's continue to take a look down the list here. But that's the thing. As more playoffs come for this franchise, as the Super Bowls come in, right, with those Super Bowls, you're going to have guys accumulate Pro Bowl seasons and and, and records. And then that's just going to push a fringe guy like Gerald down. Not saying yeah. he's not going to get in or not worthy. It's just, you know, there's there's a slide going on, All right? So uh, let's let's take a, a look here. The slide affected Jimmy. And, you, know, you know what else is going to happen? And and Ger Gerald's going to you're going Gerald's going to have a big slide effect too on the on on this list is like you say those 2020. Uh, Buccaneers that that are going to be a you know some of those guys a, a Chris Godwin could be up there yeah. pushing him down in a couple years. Yeah. I mean Antoine Winfield Jr. Who knows uh, Devin, Devin White, White those guys Tristan There's, Wirfs you know, you know uh, yeah, uh, Ali Marpet I mean Ryan Jensen yeah. who knows you know as as this team if they continue to succeed and and do well as we all expect them to do number fourteen you mentioned Jimmy Giles um, a guy that that I grew up watching um, you know when you played when you played backyard football back in the seventies. Yeah, if you were a receiver in the backyard, you wanted to be Jimmy Giles. You wanted to be number yeah. 88 because he was such a focal point of an offense in an era of football, Scott, where tight end wasn't. You know, there was no Travis Kelsey type tight ends back then. I right. mean, they were they were blocking guys who had better hands than uh <laughs> than a than an offensive lineman, but they certainly weren't um, you know, thought of as 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 major weapons. Kellen Winslow Sr. was one of those guys. There was a couple of right. guys who kind of revolutionized the position, but Jimmy Giles was one of those guys. And um, you know, a guy that I really loved watching, just ha had had the softest hands. Scott, when you watch old games of him and some of the old people in the, yes. in, the in our chat will remember the guy, it was like I it's hard to it's like his hands were almost like catcher's mitts. The ball just sucked into his hands if it was close yep. and um you know just terrific hands speedy guy for a big guy i mean he was a good sized guy right right he's a pretty good big size guy now these days i don't think he could run nearly what he ran back then but jimmy's yeah. uh jimmy's a great guy and, and, and he's a great representation a great uh advocate i'm trying to think of the right word ambassador, uh, ambassador a great to the ambassador Tampa Bay community. The organization yeah yep yeah, yep sure. to this community as well yeah. so I, I i love the fact that jimmy still made the top 15. Yeah, and th this was a guy that, that up until recently, you know, um, uh, with the catches, the yards, the, and certainly the touchdowns, he was right. Tampa Bay's all-time receiving touchdown leader. And, of course, Mike Evans has blown past him. And, and Mike is the greatest um, wide receiver pass catcher in Buccaneer history. Um, you know, he's got, he's got all the records. And, and I think that, that the next um, thing, and we'll talk about Mike in, in a couple minutes here, but um, Mike is gunning for Mike Allstott's all-time touchdown record, and that, yeah. that's gonna that's gonna happen. Uh, where Mike Mike Evans will surpass Mike Allstott probably in two seasons as the franchise's all-time leading touchdown producer. You know, so that's something to keep an eye on there as as time progresses. Um, and if, if Mike Evans continues at the pace where he's averaging 10, 12, 13 yeah. touchdowns per season, that's gonna come pretty quickly, which is which is exciting because Mike is. Is an amazing weapon. James Wilder, uh, Mark, a player you and I just love. We have mm -hmm. cam campaigned for this guy to get into Bucks Ring of Honor. I hope it happens at some point. Um, still to this day, owns a lot of <laughs> franchise rushing yeah. records. All time, yeah. uh, all time uh, leading rusher, ahead of Mike Allstott and work done. He is the still has the, the single season record for most rushing yards. Um, and I mean, it, 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 
for a while, he actually had more catches than Mike Evans did. Mike Evans yes. surpassed him, I believe, two years ago. But right. um, this guy was – he was a modern-day weapon ahead of his time. When I say modern-day weapon, you know, think Alvin Kamara, right? Think um, think just the, the, the pass-catching running backs. Heck, he was even – before Roger Craig, he was Roger Craig before Roger yeah. Craig, the 49ers. Yeah. This was a guy that was a weapon in all three downs. And the crazy thing is, I don't want to knock John McKay, right? I don't want, I don't want to have you mad at me. How, for knocking how dare you? McKay. How dare you? Don't but the thing is, that. this guy toiled away as a fullback for the first couple of years. Now, maybe yes. he wasn't ready to carry the load, right? But he was better than, than Owens, right? He was better than, who was the other guy? Uh, Carter, Gerald Carter, right? Yeah, no, Joe Carter was a receiver, but I know who okay. you're talking who about. Who am I thinking of the other guy? Uh, in 82, I'm trying to think of that, uh, the, the running back. Mel no, and it wasn't uh, Melvin Carver. Melvin Carver, it was Melvin Carver yeah. in 1982, no. who was Correct. the Buccaneers' primary running back, yeah. Right, so it's like th- these guys were not as talented as James Wilder. Yeah, James Wilder had to split carries with these guys, right. and then when he finally got the workload um, in 1984, right, where he was the – Yes. The, the guy that, that kind of became the workhorse didn't really split the carries, 407 carries, 1,544 yards, 13 touchdowns. Okay. Now, those are great numbers, right? I mean, the, you know, you put those numbers in today's, uh, you know, game, those are huge numbers. Oh, and by right. the way, that season, Wilder caught 85 passes <laughs> for 685 yards with an 8.1 average. Okay. Scott, so, Scott jo- uh, that's jo- a jo- monster Mc- season. In, in 84, John McKay, in the very last game against the Jets, I was actually at that game. Happened to be Leroy Sullivan's last home game as well because he was injured later that year at the Pro Bowl. Yeah. But um, he was within 24 yards of breaking the all-time total yards from scrimmage record. And uh, John McKay actually at, told his defense to allow the Jets to score so the Bucks could get the ball back with about two minutes left. Now, he wasn't yeah. able to get the record. I think he fell 16 yards short. But the Jets were furious. I mean, and, and yeah. you know what? I understand to a degree because that's that's not what you do in football. But occasionally you see that. But, uh, right. but he wasn't able to get the record. And then the next year, the Jets, like, absolutely destroyed the Buccaneers in a revenge yeah. game. But um, but James Wilder, um, as you said, was, was the Buccaneer offense for several years. Um, you know, he made the playoffs in 82 with the team. Uh, but he didn't make the playoffs after that because they were just bad. And uh, right. James Wilder, just a, 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 a terrific football player. And as you said, a, a do it all. I mean, there was nothing that James Wilder couldn't do. If, yeah. if John McKay would have said, hey, go play special teams and be a gunner and go make a tackle, he probably would have. He was just right. that good and that unselfish, just a tremendous football player. And the thing is, he played in some some bad Bucks teams. You know, he only made Mainly it to the Pro Bowl ones. one time. Yeah, you know, um, Paul Gruber, and number twelve, kind of the same thing. Played yeah. on some bad Bucks yeah. teams until Tony Dungy got here. But he was the first guy, and and I think you know I'm going to do a little bit of a plug for us here because tomorrow we wait. We had this guy on the podcast. That's right, Tristan Wirfs, uh, Bucks rookie sensation and Super Bowl champion from a year ago, is going to be on. Uh, with you, Mark, and either John or myself, depending on our schedules tomorrow, we'll be talking with Tristan and seeing what's up in Warps's world. You know, um, right. aside from lifting weights and getting more, <laughs> getting more massive and stronger and faster and right. jumping higher. I mean, this guy is just an absolute freak. But the reason why I bring up this Tristan Warps promo for tomorrow's short a show at four p.m. Eastern time here on the Peter Report podcast is because uh, when you look at Paul Gruber, right? You always hear it on ESPN or now it's NFL Network, right? On draft day, you always hear some draft pundits say, you know, this is the kind of guy you draft him uh, in the first round and you put him at <laughs> tackle, you know, for 10 years and you just leave him there, right? Well, that's what Paul Gruber was. He was a first round pick out sure. of Wisconsin. The Bucks drafted him and they put him at uh, left tackle for about a, a, a dozen years. Yeah. Yeah, Gruber, Gruber again, probably one of the quietest Buccaneers that I had an opportunity to to cover a little bit. I remember back in '96, you actually had me uh, go to Green Bay for a game and um, and 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 fly with the team. That's back when the the media actually used to fly with the team. And I remember, uh, you know, trying to talk to Paul Gruber, and 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 you know, he wasn't <laughs> rude by any stretch, but yeah, he just didn't have, you know, he wasn't, uh, you know, he didn't have a ton it was to all say. Business. He was all business, and he and he was going back football. to Wisconsin. 
was going back to Wisconsin, you know, Green Bay, that's his home state, of course, uh, just a tremendous guy. And, and, and you, you nailed it when you said that's exactly what he was. He was the guy the Buccaneers drafted. Again, there's nothing sexy about drafting offensive linemen, right? Nobody gets excited. Yeah. I mean, the hardcore football fans do, but, but in general, I mean, you know, you draft an offensive lineman, um, you hope you never hear their name for 10 years, right? Except at the end of the year yeah. when maybe they're going to a Pro Bowl. Because if you're hearing their name on game day, something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you just didn't hear Paul Gruber's name. I mean, he just didn't commit penalties. He was smart. He was a leader. He did everything the team asked him to do. And yeah. uh, and uh, in the saddest part about Paul Gruber's career, he finally makes the playoffs in 97. I believe that was his last year with the Buccaneers. And he ends up no, breaking it, his it leg, actually, right? Yeah, it was 99. He played in the playoffs oh, okay. in 97. Right. My he bad. got to play My bad. in two playoffs. Yes. Games, right. including up okay. in Green Bay, right, yes. for the, the second round. But, yeah. yes, in the 99 yeah. season. And I'll tell you what, I mean, I don't want to be, you know, I, I don't want to be, uh, you know, a, a Bucks 99 truther by any means, right? I mean, there's already there's already the Bert Emanuel catch, right? There, oh, there's the truthers about that, which I understand, right? That was, that was a, a big source of contention for right. Bucks fans. But what if Paul Gruber had been the left tackle in that playoff game against the Rams, does it help Sean King throw the ball better? Does yeah. it help the Bucks run the ball more than Pete Pearson? I believe was the guy. Oh right? my Pete goodness, Pearson. God. Why do you was the left that tackle. name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, love Gruber though. Great, great, uh, great call right. there. Again, I think and, Gruber and, was and, Gruber was in the top ten. You know, in our last list, if I'm not mistaken. You know, maybe I, here's a sign of some yeah. of these young guys. We're That's kind right. of pushing some of these guys down the list a little bit. Right. And, and the thing with Gruber is he's a, a Bucks Ring of Honor guy and well-deserved. No, no Pro Bowls. It's not his fault. Right. He was playing on Bucks, on bad Bucks teams and was shorted, yeah. slighted by, you know, the, the media and, and their selections. And then just really only played on, on two playoff teams, 97 and 99. So, um, and, you know, here you have uh, appreciable assets says Worfs is our future left tackle. That very well could be, you know, uh, and we'll see how it, uh, how it turns out for Wirfs, but um, you know, be sure to, to, to tune in tomorrow at 4 p.m. We're gonna have Tristan Wirfs, Bucks right tackle extraordinaire on. I'm just so gonna ask him. Fun. I'm just gonna say, yeah. like, when are you gonna take Donovan's job? I'm just gonna straight up ask him that. <laughs> First thing. No, I'm just kidding. You I'm go. not gonna ask him that. All right. So number eleven, controversial selection, right? Tom Brady, right? How in the world? And, and see that this is where the Gerald McCoy fans come into play. It's like, how in the world can Gerald, who played for the Bucks for about a decade, first round pick? Six Pro Bowls, you know, get slighted at 15 when you have one guy, you know, this Tom Brady fella, you know, come to the Buccaneers for one year and do that. Well, we remember we talked about this at the top of the show. How do you make your mark on this franchise? What do you do to affect the record book? And then what do you do to affect, you know, the championship, right? Well, the big slight for Tom Brady is, you know, he didn't win the NFC South, right? <laughs> <laughs> Drew Brees did, <laughs> right? So, so that uh, that's what Tom's gunning for. In, in addition to another Super Bowl, he wants to win that NFC South title to put that on the on the trophy shelf too. But in the meantime, um, Tom Brady in his first year with, with the Bucks set a new franchise record, broke Jameis Winston's record with forty passing touchdowns, it added three more on the ground, so forty three yeah. touchdowns, the most ever scored by a Buccaneer player in team history. So he he hits that mark, right? He he gets that that distinction, getting his name in the Bucks record book. Number two is the Super Bowl. <laughs> he got a Super Bowl uh, ring here in Tampa, and he was the MVP. So uh, yes, um, and, and Scott, look, look, I mean, listen, I, I've thought about this a lot. I, I don't think that Tom Brady is, is much correct. Okay, he wins the SB Award for Best Male Athlete. I still don't know. I think ten years from now or twenty years from now, when we look back on this. We're going to be even more amazed that a guy was able to come in after playing 20 years with one head coach and basically in one system yeah. in a pandemic year with new teammates, new coaches, new scheme, new playbook, and do what he did, including going on the road, three straight playoff games, right. and knocking off two future Hall of Famers. The, you know, If anybody questions why Tom Brady is, is where he is, let me just say this. The Buccaneers do not win the Super Bowl last year with Jameis Winston, as much as I love Jameis right. Winston. They don't win the Super Bowl with Phillip Rivers. They don't yeah. win the Super Bowl with Teddy Bridgewater. Any of right. the other options out there, he was the guy. And right. we talked about it from one of the very first press conferences with a player, I think it was Cam Brady, that we had uh, last spring after Brady was signed when they were doing their workouts out at one of the local high schools. Cam Brady, I believe, was the first one to say, nobody wants to be the guy 
to disappoint Tom Brady. That That's right. started on a high school practice field before they ever gathered at one Buccaneer place. That's that great doesn't point. tell you why he's on the top 15 and at number 11. I don't know yeah. what else I can tell you. I mean, he's just uh, – there's a reason why he's the greatest quarterback that ever played in the yeah. NFL, and, and he deserves to be on this list, even – if they only ends up winning one Super Bowl, if he plays another two years and they get yeah. bounced out of the playoffs, he still deserves the position that he's at for what he did last year. There's no doubt about it. And 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 the, that's the thing, too. It's like, you know, Jameis Winston is, used to be on the top 25 list, right? Because yeah. he was trending that way. Sure. And, and even though he has still franchise records for most passing touchdowns, most passing yards, right? I mean, he's the, the top guy in Buccaneer history, 19,000 yards. Um, he doesn't make the list because, you know, one Pro Bowl appearance and despite all the yards, no playoffs, right? Yeah. And so so longevity doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make this list. And keep in mind, before beating um, – or before getting that, that all-time record for the passing yards, you know, Vinny Testaverde had that. Josh Freeman had the, the touchdown, the passing right. touchdown record. So just because you're in the record book doesn't mean that you're going to be on this list. It's, when you're the best the combination. Of, when you're the best it, of a mediocre bunch, it still doesn't give you the you know, the correct. ranking of, yeah. of being one of the top twenty five guys, certainly not right. one of the top fifteen guys. I mean, yeah. it's just it, it, yeah. It's the criteria. It's what did you do from a record standpoint, from, from right. a you know an honor standpoint, Pro Bowls, All Pros, et cetera. What did you do from a team standpoint, playoff seasons, championships, division, or Super Bowl? And then would you be considered for the Bucks Ring of Honor? Right. Vinny Testaverde is not going to be. Josh Freeman's not going to be. Right. Jameis Winston's not going to be. And guess what? Those are the top three passers. In, yeah. In, franchise, in history. franchise history. So and, none and, of those and, guys and, make the list for that reason. And if Jameis Winston had averaged 12 interceptions over those five years, he would be there, right? But you can't take that away right. either. I mean, you you got to look at the good. Certainly, you give him credit for 5,000 yards and, and right. 33 touchdowns in 2019. Those 30 interceptions, man, they loom big. Uh, yeah. And, and and the years before that as well. Right. I mean, those have, Mark, that has to be factored in as well. Mark, what also looms big right now is the fact that uh, we're in hurricane season, right? I mean, yes. we've already had one little hurricane roll through, you know. Um, and I think Briar Greaves can help everybody out right now. Can they not? And, and I, I tell people all the time, and we, we tried to warn them in the spring, make sure you're covered. Make sure that you have the coverage that you need. Briar Greaves is the place to do it. Listen, hurricane season lasts through November. There's no reason why everybody listening right now hasn't called Briar Greaves for at the very least to get a quote on their automobile insurance, maybe their life insurance, renter's policy. There's not a type of insurance that anybody listening here doesn't need some type of insurance that Briar Greaves covers. Scott, they can save people money. They save me money. They saved you money. What I love about Briar Greaves is they'll take a look at your policy, whatever it be, auto, home, life. They'll take a look at it. They'll shop it around. They've got multiple carriers throughout the country that they can shop it to. Maybe able to find you some cheaper rates. They might not be able to, but the great thing about them is they're not going to BS you, Scott. They're going to tell you straight up, we can save you some money. Or they may say, you know what? You got a really good deal where you're at. I would stick where you are. And they're Buccaneer fans. What more can you want? BriarReevesInsurance.com, locally in Tampa for over 31 years. They've been around as long as John's been alive. That should tell you something <laughs> right there, Scott. Uh, yeah. and they've been around longer than you and I have covered this football team. That tells right. you how yeah, long I'm they've a, been around. I'm only in year 26. So Yeah, and, and, and you can give them a call at 813-876-4166. Again, 813-876-4166. We need you to call Briar Greaves. Why? because they're a sponsor of this podcast. They're the reason, along with our other sponsors, that we're able to do this four times a week. Without them, it just doesn't happen. BriarReevesInsurance.com, 813-876-4166. Top 10 times, Scott. Yep. The guy that Devontae I had off David. my list. I had him 11. John thought I was crazy. A lot of our readers thought we were crazy, too. It's not like I had him at 25. I had him at 11, personally. But Levante David. Um both of you and I have had the pleasure. We were sitting in the media room the day, the the, the night that he was drafted uh, yeah. by the Buccaneers. And uh, wait, wait, was it a night or was it the next day? I don't even really remember. Was he? It was uh, um, Mark Barron and Doug Martin in the first round. So it would have been yeah, Levante David on Friday pick. night. So it was still a night, but it was the second Correct. round. It was the second yeah. night of the draft. But you and I were there, and we both thought it was an outstanding pick. But Scott, let's be honest. Neither one of us could have predicted the career that Levante David had. We had hopes, okay, maybe he can be right. a really good linebacker for this organization for a while. This He's guy has seen 
two contract extensions. That's just yeah. unheard of in, in Buccaneer town, right? I remember yeah. remember when Gerald got his new deal and then and the lot they got his new deal. That was a big thing because right. so many players, you know, were, you know, they would get drafted, they would play their four or five years and they were done. And yeah. uh and Gerald was one of the first in a while to get a second contract. Levante's had two of those. That just tells you how great of a linebacker and a performer Levante David is for this organization. Yeah, simply put, he is the second best linebacker of, of all time in Bucks history. And you know he's moving up up the the list. He's he's going to be, um, I think, in the, in the top three in terms of tackles uh, behind Derek Brooks and Rondé Barber. Um, when it's all said and done, he's in elite company, and uh, he does, he deserves to be a number ten. Um, if he gets another Super Bowl, if he climbs a little higher, um, yeah. I think this is a this is a, a a list. This top ten now. This is where it's going to be hard to knock some of these guys down a peg in advance, right? right? This is this is where it kind of gets cemented a little bit, right? Like, uh, I don't know on, on this particular list. You can see Warren Sapp at one, and we'll get to him in a second, but, you know, is there a current Buccaneer that's going to ever surpass Warren Sapp or even Derek Brooks or Leroy Summon for the top three, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, um, that that's going to be interesting. Um, <coughs> if Mike Evans... If he if he gets, you know, a, a, another eight thousand yard, I'm sorry, another thousand um, yard season for number eight, another thousand yard season for number nine, and wins another Super Bowl, right? There's two Super Bowls, uh, an NFL record that would probably be out of reach um, for for anybody else to to hit. Um, and then, and, and breaking, not 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 just with the Buccaneers. I'm talking about the NFL. I mean, this guy's I mean. done yeah, something that nobody's I mean. done. And so, right. the odds of another Buccaneer overtaking Mike Evans, right. Scott, that's not going to happen in our lifetime, in my opinion. I agree. I mean, and, and, as good as Chris Godwin is, he's not off to the hot start that Mike Evans right. was. I mean, he's yeah. you know he's going on to his second contract or or, or the franchise tag now, and yeah. uh, it, it's it's not even it's not even he's not even close. As good as he is, he's still not even close to putting up the numbers that Mike Evans right. Has. Speaking of Chris Godwin, a little little bit of, of news I can share. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the voice is going a little bit. <clears throat> Thursday is the deadline to get an extension done with the franchise tagged Chris Godwin. The Bucks would like to do something long term, but they're not optimistic. So expect Thursday to come and go, and for Chris Godwin to play on his franchise tag. That's that's what I think is going to happen based upon the information I've gathered. So. Repeat that again because my my mic cut. I mean, my earphones cut out for a second. I'm sorry. Repeat that again. Yeah. So Chris Godwin's franchise tag. Right. There's a deadline Thursday to get an extension done. Otherwise, he has to play on the franchise tag. Now, the team would like to get something done, but given the numbers, they're not optimistic. Something will happen. So look for Chris Godwin to play on his franchise tag this year and for Thursday's deadline to come and go without an extension. Okay. Well, and you know, and, I uh, and Mark, that's not the end of the world. No, we saw what happened with Shaq Barrett. He did exactly. the same thing. Yeah, and then the, the you know next year, um, it it resulted in a long term extension. So I, I think that's in the cards for Chris Godwin. But look for him to play on that that uh, franchise tag. So uh, Levante is ten. Simeon Rice number number nine. This is a player that came to Tampa Bay as a prized free agent signing and all he did for the first five seasons as a Buccaneer is get double digit sacks in every one of those years. 11, Amazing. Yeah. 15 and a half, 15, 12 and 14. No other Buccaneer has done that. Not Leroy, not Warren Sapp. Uh, this guy finished with 69.5 sacks, 69 and a half sacks. The 69 and a half sacks is third behind Warren Sapp and Leroy Selman. Uh, Selman has 78 and a half. He's got the, the team record. And then Sapp is behind him with 77. So Simeon Rice is elite. He deserves to be in the Bucks ring of honor. You could say he has a case as a, as a guy that has, he's part of the 100 sack club as a fringe Hall of Famer. But um, Simeon Rice is one of the, the, the best pure pass rushers of all time for this yeah. franchise history. Yeah, and just a freak of an athlete. I mean, his wingspan. Um, Simeon Rice, you know, him and Warren Sapp, Scott, on third down while the offense was in the huddle, that was must-watch TV or from your seat, right? 
both those guys were amped up. They knew it was their down on third yeah. down, and they would play to the crowd, especially at Raymond James Stadium, just watching those guys getting amped up on third down while the offense was breaking the huddle. You knew one of those right. two guys was getting ready to create havoc, and and more often than not, it was Simeon Rice. John makes a good point. He occasionally does, even though he's young. Scott, <laughs> Simeon Rice would be dominant, absolutely dominant in today's NFL, right? Some of these yeah. guys, I don't know. I mean, I don't right. know. I mean, some of these older guys, right? I mean, sure. how would they? I mean, Leroy someone I think was 260 pounds. I don't know how right. he would fend as a, as a three, four D end in, in today's NFL, but Simeon yeah. rice absolutely would be a beast and would be amongst the top sack leaders today. Uh, just as he was back in the two thousands for the Buccaneers. And, right. you know, he, he, he had a monster career in Arizona before he came to Tampa Bay. Um, I, you say fringe hall of fame. I think it's foolish that he's even considered fringe. I think he definitely deserves it. When you look at some of the guys I agree. who yeah. have less, uh, less sacks and, 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 right. and, and let's take a look at the impact too. Now, is there a bias by the NFL because they've already put in John Lynch and and um, and and Derek Brooks and Warren Sapp? That's already three players off of that Super Bowl team. Do they not want right. to put floor in there? I think that's just stupid. You look yeah. at the Pittsburgh Steelers well, in the and, 70s and, and some and of those John. teams. There's multiple, multiple. You just called me John. There's multiple yeah, John Steelers Lynch. from those era yeah. that, are, that, that were Super Bowl winners that are in the, play, the, the Hall of Fame. I think Simeon yeah. Rice that certainly deserves it. John Lynch made – the hall of fame. And honestly, I think if you look at the resumes and it, it's, it's apparent on this list here that Rondé Barber had a better career in Tampa than John Lynch did. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Rondé, the thing about Rondé and, and I guess we'll, we'll, we'll kind of skip ahead a little bit. I love Rondé. Yeah. You talk about the longevity factor. That's just amazing. What he was able to do from day oh, yeah. one. And Scott, you love to tell the story that Rondé Barber they drafted Brian Kelly to replace Rondé Barber. I yeah. mean, he was that big of a bust his first year. He, you know, he Correct. saw the field very, very little in his very first yeah. year. Nobody, nobody could have saw what Rondé right. Barber was going to become. And he revolutionized that position at the nickel cornerback. Then late in his career, unselfishly switched to safety. Here's a guy who played hurt. Here's a guy who played with injury just wasn't going to miss a football game. He's just right. uh, one of the greatest Buccaneer. He's not just one of the greatest Buccaneers. He's one of the greatest yeah. NFL players when you look at his, his no career doubt objectively. And, and you mentioned injury, and I think that's what kind of has John Lynch a little bit further down this list. Now, Warren Sapp um, texted me over the weekend, right? He was very, very involved in reading all of our stories on <laughs> PeterReport.com. He was curious where he would end up. Yeah. Um, so we, Warren and I texted over multiple days. He disagreed with having Mike Evans in the top five, and he believed that Doug Williams and John Lynch should have been in the top five uh, in, instead of Rondé and Mike Evans. So that's that's Warren. Doug, thing. and you know I love Doug, but you and yeah. I went back and forth on Doug. You didn't necessarily yeah. even want Doug in the top twenty-five at, at first, based on statistics. But yeah, and I tend to be, be with the, like the top Warren. forty. So yeah. I tend to be with Warren. I mean, no, Doug is not a top five Buccaneer of all time, right. uh, but certainly what Doug Williams went through. And I think you, I think when we start looking at criteria, um, you know, the fact that he was one of the very first African-American quarterbacks to be drafted mm -hmm. uh, from a small school. Grambling was small, is small. Sure. It's, you know, it's not like he came from, from USC or something like that. And, and right. came into a bad situation with a bad football team. And uh, in a year later, his second year in the NFL, he's leading the Buccaneers to a division title. Um, yeah, just a just a. But anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you on the Warren Sapp. Yeah, thing. go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, John Lynch. What helped him get into the Hall of Fame is not just the fact that he was a five time Pro Bowler in Tampa and a two time All Pro, and helping the Bucks get to the '97, '99, 2002 um, championship seasons. Uh, actually, '97 wasn't. They were a wild card team, but they won division titles in '99 and 2002. Made the playoffs in 97, 2000, 2001. So, you know, he, John Lynch is, is a legend. Don't get me wrong. But what helped his Hall of Fame candidacy are those four Pro Bowls with Denver. Yeah. 2004, 5, 6, 7, after he left Tampa. And it was that neck injury that really kind of derailed his time in Tampa. They, they had to part ways with him after the 2003 season, you know, Bruce Allen said, you know, you know, here's John age 32 with a neck injury, you know, our doctors can't clear him medically to Lynch's credit. You know, he found sustained success <laughs> in Denver. Right. But again, when you look at, at those pro bowls and the championship uh, and, and Lynch was good. He was a playmaker. He was a key to that defense in the, the Tampa two. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking John Lynch, but it's just that from a, 
a record book stand standpoint, you know, John Lynch is the best safety in Tampa Bay history. Yeah. But he, you know, he was not the interceptor that even Donnie Abraham or Rondé Barber was. Um, he was enforcer and he was a, a key leader for that team. But I, I have a hard time putting him above some of the other guys on the list. And let's let's look at number number seven, Mike Allstad, for example. Very controversial selection. A lot of people point out this is a guy that averaged, I think, 3.8 yards per carry, never had a 1,000-yard season, okay, but was recognized as a six-time Pro Bowler, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of like Gerald McCoy in that respect, right. six-time Pro Bowler. But Mike Allstott affected the record book. All-time franchise touchdown leader, 71 touchdowns uh, rushing, and then um, 78, including the playoffs, Right. And yeah. And you, you look back when the game was on the line, Mike got the ball yes. either to salt away a win. Right. He was the four minute back, the anvil, as as uh, John Gruden called him. He was the A train, the guy that salted away wins. It started in 1997, marking the playoff game against the Lions with the 20 yard touchdown run to, yeah. to seal that game. But this was a guy that was the closer. And and everybody knew Mike was getting the ball. <laughs> Third and two, he was going to get the ball. And guess right. what? It was a two-yard gain. It didn't help his average, but he got the right. first down, kept the clock moving, chains moving, and the Bucks winning. He also scored the first touchdown at Philadelphia that was a huge like weight off the Buccaneers' back. Right after That came after the Juravicious catch, right? Yes. That was their first touchdown. After playoff yeah. debacles from an offensive sure. standpoint. Right, where they could not get in the end zone. 2001, yeah. they couldn't get in the, in the end zone. That touchdown was a psychological boost. Keyshawn Johnson, I think, added another one right before halftime, gave the Bucks the lead going into halftime in the 2002 NFC Championship game. Then, Mark, who scores the first touchdown in the Super Bowl? Michael Pittman? Nope. Uh, Keenan McCardell? No. Mike no, Michael Allstott, Stott. Right? Wait. Um, th- 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 there, was, there was a game. Absolutely. There was a game in 2005 against the Washington Redskins. Uh, where John Gruden, instead of tying the game, wanted to go for two to win it, right? And yes. gave the ball to Mike Allstott. Allstott barely gets in, but whenever the game was on the line, Mike got the ball. Yes. It scored all those yep. touchdowns. And so between not just running the ball, you also catching the ball as a, as a multi-purpose weapon and blocking. Didn't he, have, didn't he have over 70 receptions as a rookie when he played? I mean, he was a true fullback that 65. year. Right? He had yeah. a ton of receptions that year, and, uh, yes. and 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 again, you give him a little space in the open field. There was no safety or no cornerback that wanted to step up and catch this guy. Yeah, nobody wanted to get in front of him. Right. I said that that watching Warren Sapp and Simeon Rice on third down was must watch TV. Anytime right. Mike Allstott touched the ball in the fourth quarter, uh, you were standing up if you were in those stands. That's right. And, and I'll be honest with you, there were a few times, Scott, in the press yeah. box where we had to stand up to watch this guy because it yeah. was that exciting. You his, ask any offensive lineman. Cleveland, right? His game against the yes. Vikings. There's yes. so many all-stop moments. And the one thing that the stat nerds and the analytic geeks always Come like to point out that, that – Yeah, well, they always like to, to point out that 3.8-yard average. Okay, fine. But there are certain – things that you can't measure from an analytical standpoint exactly. momentum momentum is not yes. a measurable right uh, aspect of the game right but it's very real in some of those tackle breaking runs that mike ripped off where it might have been a 13 yard gain but he broke four tackles to do it that it energized the fans it energized the offense his, his teammates the offensive yes. scott how many times did we as reporters and even you ask uh, offensive linemen today what they'd rather see, a 30-yard touchdown run where a guy's bowling people over to the end zone or an 80-yard touchdown pass. And they'll tell you they'll take that run all day long. Nothing gets your five guys up front more amped up than to see the back of the jersey of the right. guy they're blocking for That's running right. over people. And Mike Allstott was a master of that. And let me tell you something, guys. It's hard to average five yards of carry when you're running for three-yard touchdowns. This guy, I mean, you know, I mean, you take away right. all those short yardage touchdown rounds. I mean, the guy right. probably was a four well, and a half yard average. He how, was just called many, on to beat that guy inside yeah. the five yard line. And and how many times did Mike run into a loaded front, like a yes. stacked box, right? Where yes. they knew Mike was going to get the ball. Yes. And it was third and two. And everyone in the stadium knew he was going to get it. And he still got the yards he needed, right? I mean, yes. that's, that's, that's tough sledding. 
So, um, Mike Allstott, a Bucks Ring of Honor guy, well deserved for that number seven spot. Hardy Nickerson, number six, another guy should get into the Bucks Ring of Honor. Matter, matter of fact, I'm putting him or Simeon Rice in next if I'm the Glaciers. Uh, Hardy Nickerson, 1993, was a surprise key free agent signing from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm -hmm. He was the guy that started the culture change. Yep. Nickerson was a very good linebacker. Um, made multiple Pro Bowls with with the Buccaneers, um, and you know that that first season, two hundred and fourteen tackles. That is that is still today a franchise record, single season franchise record, and it's not going to get broken. It's just not <laughs> because teams don't run the ball enough up the middle right. to where you're going to have a linebacker have the opportunity to get two hundred and fourteen tackles. But uh, Nickerson was a five-time Pro Bowler for the Buccaneers, 93, 96, 97, 98, and 99, and a one-time All-Pro. But more importantly, it was the culture change. He was the veteran that that provided the mentorship and the leadership for John Lynch, who was a 93 Absolutely. draft pick, yep. for Warren Sapp and Derek Brooks' 95 draft picks. He literally picked fist fights with the – lazy turd buccaneer players back in the day that thought they were leaders but they really right. weren't he was the sheriff that came to town and cleaned up dodge city yep and uh and he was a great player and you know he helped groom those three leaders 99 was his last season as a buccaneer you know he was at the time uh, 34 years old in 1999 uh, but he handed the baton off to all three of those guys it was a three-headed monster between brooks sap and lynch and they won a Super Bowl, but Hardy Nickerson laid the foundation and was an absolute legendary linebacker. Uh, when it's all said and done, Hardy will be the third best linebacker in franchise history because Levante David will likely surpass him on this list. Scott, was there a nicer guy off the field who was a bigger jerk on the field than Hardy Nickerson, right? I mean, oh, you and I covered ass. Hardy. Just um, a badass. Kind of a shy guy at times, you know what I mean? Kind of, you know, even when he coached yeah. here with Lovey Smith that one year, even when he did the yeah, radio network, intense. you know, Just real kind of, you know, you know, it, when he got on the football field, though, the man was a maniac. Something else that yeah. people don't really remember about Hardy, and and I had to be reminded about it. Chidi actually texted me, and 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 texted me on my article of 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 my uh, of the best Buccaneers of all time, and he said a lot of people forget that uh, Hardware, he called him Hardware, yeah, hardware. Uh, didn't join the Bucks as a Plan B free agent. He was an unrestricted free agent, which was part of that name plane. It was a name plaintiff on the Reggie White versus the NFL yeah. um, case that actually ushered in unrestricted free agency. But That's because right. the year before. Was or that year in that respect right absolutely he changed you know what we see there would be no tom brady with the buccaneers possibly yeah. right now if it wasn't for a guy like hardy nickerson back in the day right. so uh anyway that's another thing you you yeah. factor that in as well but oh, i, I love hardy and, and his his uh his passion and his attitude yeah um again nice 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 guy but 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 he would he would stare at you with those eyes and i would not want to be a running back running towards hardy nickerson Hardware, and i love you know what i love about him he wore, the, he wore the orange and white and the uh, red and pewter. He got to That's wear right. both of them. One yeah. of a handful of great players that were able to do that. And and the thing with Hardy Nickerson too is is uh, you you know whenever the Bucks would have that that stop on third down, he'd walk off the field and do that that incredible Hulk flex yeah. for yeah. the crowd, get them yeah. all fired up. So uh, he was the culture changer for this this franchise, and uh, and that was that was awesome. So moving on with this list here, uh, boy. It, it's it's crazy, right? But I mean, you know, here we talk about Mike Evans. We've talked about him uh, uh, a lot already. But but um, I think Mike Evans, if you look at the list now, he's the greatest offensive player in Bucks history, and and he's still got franchise records to break. We talked about him closing in on on Mike Allstott's all time touchdown record, uh, which will probably not happen this year, but the year after. And. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this guy, you know, he, he got the playoffs, he got the Super Bowl, and I think that just absolutely cements his status. He got the record, the eight straight mm -hmm. seasons to, um, or the seven, he's at seven, seven yeah. now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seven straight seasons. He'll get eight this year. That's my prediction. Really going out of limb there, aren't I, Mark? <laughs> yeah. The way, but but uh, know, he's careful. 20, what, 27, 28 years old. I mean, he still has three, four more. Uh, excellent type seasons. This guy's not slowing down. He fights through injuries. He's a selfless player. He's a Super Bowl champion, and uh, he's still going strong. And as of right now, 
with the three Pro Bowls, the Super Bowl ring, the records that he is the that he's set, including last year. Mark, he didn't have a great year, right? He barely made a thousand yards, right? Which is still better than most, right? But um, but 13 touchdowns. He broke his own single season touchdown yeah. record that he set as a rookie in 2014, that he tied in 2016 and uh, fought through hamstring, ankle, knee injuries. Um, and, and, you know, we're sitting there watching him get the record thousand yards against the Falcons has the, the, the freak slippage in the end zone where, you know, it looked like his knee buckled, might've torn something. And we're like, Oh my gosh, is he going to yes. miss the playoffs? Yes. No, he, he goes out there and like has <laughs> you know, 80 yards against the, the Washington football team the next right. week and plays in the game. And, and then a touchdown against uh, green Bay to help get the, the scoring, uh, you know, going in the NFC championship game. Um, there's nothing that Mike Evans can't do, Mark. And, and I, Scott, we're not supposed to play favorites in the media, uh, but I have a hard time. He's one of my not, favorites. Not saying he's not my favorite current Buccaneer. Uh, I know you love Levante, and there's a couple other guys on this team that, that, that we've gotten to know over the years. But Mike Evans, again, I've said it a thousand times. I'll say it again. Most unassuming $20 million a year guy you'll ever right. meet. I mean, when you hang out with Mike Evans at his charity events, at his golf tournaments, um, after practice, He's just a good guy, right? Just a yeah. regular guy. It's just amazing that money and fame and all these things haven't went to his head. Now, he's a confident guy, and you have to be to play that position to be as successful as he has. But just a great, great human being. And I love what he does in the community as well, in the Houston community and also the Tampa Bay community where he raises yeah. money for his foundation um, that, that provides money and, and scholarships to children whose lives have been affected by domestic violence. When you look at Mike's story, he – is an asterisk. Uh, is that the right word I'm trying to come up with? He shouldn't be where he is today based on how he grew up, right? Watching yeah. his father get shot by his uncle or something along those lines. I mean, just a, just a, you know, a, a success story. And and, yeah. and what I love is that he wants to pass that along man. to and absolutely, absolutely man. a guy that could have easily just curled up in his shell and, and turned the other way. And, and he used athletics. And here's the thing, Scott, he played one year of high school football one his yeah, senior year basketball he was, you know, yeah school. it was a basketball guy he goes to a&m he plays two years yeah right he red shirts and he plays two years he pretty and, much and, made the, the 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 legend of johnny manzel which really there's turned out to no be the, doubt about the it. myth of johnny manzel because it was more mike evans than it was johnny manzel right and i wanted just, the buccaneers to draft Jenny, johnny manzel i wanted him to draft a quarterback after watching the josh mccown year the year before in 2014 <laughs> and manzel right. was you know kind of the consensus guy still on the board at the time i actually liked sammy watkins a little bit better coming out only because i watched more clemson games than i had texas yeah. a&m games but man Man, there's I, I love being wrong, and I had I right. had no problem admitting I was a complete idiot to doubt Mike Evans. Not that I doubted him, but yeah. it didn't you know make me jump up and down the night that he was drafted. But man, was I Listen, wrong? He's I, been I just one Jason of the best players Light, ever. I don't think Jason Light saw that you know seven straight thousand yard seasons. For no, this guy, right? no, but I, no. I, tribute to Mike because Mike's will to be great, Mike's will to win, yeah, um, has has put him on this path and. Um, and he deserves all the credit. I know there was a lot of help along the way, but listen, Mike Evans is the man in Tampa Bay yeah, right now. Yeah, he just yeah. is. It, and think about all the money that he has uh, switched up his contract a couple times, yeah. at least during his time here, so that the Buccaneers would have some He's salary cap space. Yeah. They're very, very unselfish when it comes to those things. So, anyway, right, so, love Mike Evans. Here's your guy, though. Your favorite yeah. Buccaneer. I know this, of is, all this time. is a fact of all time. Of all time. This was your mother. Barbara. Your mom's favorite, rest in peace, Judy. But your yes. mom absolutely loved. I remember we were at dinner at uh, at the uh, pizza place at West Shore, and yeah. you actually called From your mom when we were having lunch with, uh, no, with Ronnie no, she, Barber. Oh, she, she called you. Called. Yes, and you said, yeah, "Guess who I'm having lunch with right now?" And I could no. It wasn't, it, remember, we were sitting there with Ronde. This is right. this was like um, this was like uh, during the lockout, right? Where there um, there wasn't any any. Uh, off-season workouts, no OTAs. Ronnie was kind of bored, right? Yeah. And um, uh, remember, we, we went to lunch with Ronnie a couple of times. I might be getting these these uh, times mess, uh, mixed up, but anyways, yes, there was a time where, where we're having lunch with Ronnie, and my mom calls, and my mom's a huge Ronnie Barber fan, and I, I just looked down the phone. I said, "Hey, Ronnie," I said, oh, "This is right. my mom. She's a huge fan. Would you mind answering?" You know, <laughs> and so he's like, "Yeah, sure." So he's like. He's like, Judy, hi, this is Rondé Barber. Uh, oh. Scott, uh, Scott wanted me to answer the phone and tell you hello. She just 
was ecstatic. Scott, I could hear her voice through the phone, yes. right? He didn't even oh, have it on speakerphone. She was so she was happy. freaking out. That, that was awesome. But uh, yeah. anyway, sorry. Yeah, he's your favorite guy, yeah. and for good reason. I mean, yeah. Um, no, you and I will have to tell the story. We won't tell it this time because we're running yeah. so long on the podcast now. Right. But readers remind us to tell the story of of Rondé Barber being the enforcer in the locker room. Akeem yes. Lee Brick Stroud. <laughs> we'll right. tell that story one day soon. That's that was a good one. Um, yeah. So here's the thing with Rondé. You mentioned right? Uh, like the Ironman status, Rondé Barber, the longevity, 16 seasons longer than anybody in franchise history. And Mark, I don't see anybody playing 16 consecutive <laughs> seasons for the Buccaneers. Again, I just no. don't. Um, oh, and by the way, the last 13 of those seasons, he didn't miss a game. Amazing. 16 out of 16 for the last 13 years of his career. Absolute uh, legend, legendary toughness from Barber, but legendary playmaker um, for this franchise. 47 interceptions. He beats Donnie Abraham's all-time interception uh, record. 28 sacks. He he was really the prototype for the nickel corner. And the thing is, when people think of nickel corners these days, they think of guys that come in on third down to play in the slot. Rondé Barber didn't do that. Rondé Barber played outside corner on first right. and second down. And then he moved inside on third down or obvious passing downs to the slot. But Rondé Barber didn't come off the field, right? So that, that's that's what allowed him to rack up all the tackles. Yeah. This is the franchise's all-time games played, game started guy. And, uh, uh, you know, a legendary Hall of, uh, Hall of Fame candidate, I think he deserves to be in easy. Absolutely. Because Not even close. Of, of, yeah, of the production. Um and so I, I, I don't, I don't know how Rondé Barber moves out of that fourth spot, right? So now let's let's take a, a question here, real quick, before we get into the top three, and we're going to wrap this up pretty quickly. We'll talk about all three at the same time, but it's interesting to kind of uh, there's a there's a bit of a of a conundrum, right, with with Tom Brady because we already have him at number eleven. Okay, so. Looking into your crystal ball, how high is this list when Brady retires? Well, it depends on what he does, right? Um, Two more so, Super Bowls. If he wins three Super Bowls, he's a yeah. top five guy. But if Tom Brady wins two in a row, has a perfect season, does he go to the top? You know, <laughs> that, that's that's something, right? Because the top yeah. guys right now, Sapp and Brooks, each have one Super Bowl, which is the same as Brady. Um, you know, they both have accomplished a lot in terms of their record books and, and all that. Derek Brooks is the most the most accomplished Buccaneer of all time. We'll rattle off his stats here in just, just a second here, but but yeah, that's something to really kind of have to consider, right? Is is how high I mean, Tom goes? The, let's not. You're forgetting the the perfect season. That's what he's asking. Look, yes, if this guy leads this team to a 20 and 0 season and that's what it would be right 17 regular season games three playoff games including the yes. super bowl because we're they would win the division right. so yeah. um not, he would almost have to be scott and i say that because that would that would give him eight super bowls he would there would be no argument he's the not just the greatest quarterback of all time possibly the greatest athlete of all time so yeah. i think it would be hard pressed for us not to put him <laughs> as the greatest buccaneer of all time if you were to handle if we were to do that then if we were to go win a third yeah. super bowl for this football team although right. i i don't know why i have a feeling if he goes 20 and 0 and wins a super bowl he walks away i don't know that yeah. to be the case i i mean <laughs> right. you can't script it any better okay so let, let's just let's just you know play some fantasy football here for a second mark okay what if tom brady uh has a pro bowl season is an all pro quarterback wins the MVP right for the league in helping the Bucks go 17 and 0 the regular season winning a Super Bowl and then being the MVP of that game right i mean no one's ever done that right to have right. that and that, that, that's not a trifecta what is that a, the quinn factor i don't even know if there's Quad a word factor. For i don't even know yeah 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 but if, think about it pro bowl all pro uh, MVP of the league division champion <laughs> Super Bowl champion and then Super Bowl MVP. Knock and on some wood, Scott. You're jinxing this season. guy. You're uh, jinxing this guy. This team's he's gonna go eight and eight. He's I think you're right. I think you're right. 
Yeah, all right. No, so he's he, he Scott. I, I think he's something to think about. <laughs> he overtakes he overtakes Michael Jordan to me as the greatest athlete of all time. If he were to if he does that, that yeah, 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 no, no doubt. Okay, so Leroy Selman, uh, the original. Now let's let's talk about just generally speaking here because the last time we did this list, Derek Brooks was number one, Leroy was number two, Sap was number three. You made a point that year, your argument, which you lost because mm-hmm. I overruled you, of course, uh, but. But you've actually won the argument now four years later because I see your light. I see the light that you're putting yes. out. Yes. And that light is, and you asked me, okay, I know Derek Brooks accomplished more, right? Um, and, and then Warren Sapp did. And what would what, what you what what I meant by that in terms of Derek Brooks is this is a guy that ended up playing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen seasons in Tampa. Fourteen. Okay. Mm-hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve-time Pro Bowler, if I can count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or eleven. Looks like eleven-time Pro Bowler. Um, five-time All Pro. Two thousand two NFL Defensive Player of the Year and Super Bowl champion. Right. Nobody has accomplished more in terms of right. accolades than Derek Brooks. Uh, even Rondi Barber played 16 seasons, doesn't have the Pro Bowl, doesn't have the the division, uh, or I should say the, the defensive player of the year. Now, what not, Rondi not did. Not just Buccaneers, not many players in the history of the league Correct. accomplished as many accolades as Derek Brooks has. Correct. I agree. Yeah. Now, now the one thing we, we, we left off and talking about Rondi is he has the franchise's signature play, the 92 yard pick six, yeah. right? That, yeah. That's, that, that's also keeping him in the top five. But right. with Derek Brooks, more accomplished than Warren Sapp, right? I mean, Brooks is yeah. the all-time tackle leader. No one's going to surpass him. Uh, I mean, Levante David won't. <laughs> okay, no. as good uh, as Levante won't. is, he's not going to come close. Yeah, There's no way he's going to come close. Yeah, no. there's just no way. Devin White is not off to the start where he can even catch him unless he plays like 15, 16 years or something. Right. Um, but when you look at Sap. SAP uh, Pro Bowls in 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. That is a six time Pro Bowler, three time All Pro, second most sacks in franchise history. Had the single season sack record up until uh, his good friend Shaq Barrett broke it, yep. right? So, a Hall of Famer, just like Brooks. But the thinking was between Brooks and SAP, and your question was, Okay, Scott, I get that Derek Brooks accomplished more. Mm-hmm. You know, Sapp also had a, an NFL Defensive Player of the Year award in 1999. It was the league's MVP um, or from the defensive standpoint. But your question was, if you're going to start a franchise yes, and you're going to draft any of these Buccaneers. Now, right. <laughs> now we might start with Tom Brady now. Yes, <laughs> now, now with Tom Brady. That's, yeah, right. Yeah. But out of the top three, that, that's what you're saying. Out of the top three, Selman Brooks – or sap who are you drafting number one overall and yeah, it was it was sap. the right answer it's always sap. been sap to me yes. it's always been yes. sap to me and and and, and, I've, and i've come and, around on that and and, 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 and people, I, I i think that the line is so close between brooks and sap that that's that's the deciding factor because yeah. in my mind it was like 1a and 1b right with brooks and then sap but when you ask that question mark who are you going to draft and i think the thing is is even today even today, not in 1999, but in 2021, right. if you, if you were to and, and you even said this, you know, can Leroy Selman at, at 6'3", 255 play defensive end? He's probably an outside linebacker mm-hmm. at, at the size right now, right? Derek right. Brooks still, I mean, he'd be a hell of a player, but six foot two twenty. I mean, is he big <laughs> enough to play in in this day and age and still be as impactful? You know, I don't want to take anything away from Derek Brooks, right? But, but Warren Sapp at 6'1", 300 pounds, yeah, he he can still play. You see Aaron Donald, right? Like you you still see those three technique one gap defensive tackles play and affect the game. Good pass rushing defensive tackles always hard to find. Yes, he yep. is the number one draft pick for this franchise. If you're going to draft it. Uh, any of those three and start the franchise, it starts with Warren Sapp and he is the yeah. best Buccaneer of all time. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and, and Warren, you know, again, there's a bit of a bias there because Warren was surly. He could be a jerk. He was not fan friendly at many times. We, Scott, we you and I, we, we, we all have, I, I mean, yeah. Sapp has, has been my best friend 
uh, uh, when we're watching practice and 10 minutes later is ripping me a new one. I mean, that's the right. kind of guy that Warren Sapp is. You don't know what yeah. you're going to get with Warren Sapp, but I don't <laughs> care about any of those things. All I know is, and you used to say this, Scott, I don't, I don't have to hang around Sapp six days a week, but I, there's nobody I want on the football field playing for my football team for three hours on Sunday more than Warren yeah. Sapp. And he was just that impactful and a game changer. He set the tone even before the games. He would always go kick the opponent's pile on. He'd flip his yeah. helmet up with us. I mean, Stare just the icon yeah. iconic things that Warren Sapp did. Um, I, I loved everything about him. I loved his attitude. I loved his persistence, his tenacity, his confidence. You know, the one thing that I love as much about Warren Sapp as anything is Warren Sapp is the most honest person you'll meet. I don't always agree right. with Warren Sapp, but he's always honest. But Warren Sapp told us one time, Scott, he remembered the specific play when he was with the Oakland right. Raiders where he decided, I'm going to retire. When he yeah. couldn't beat, I forgot who it was, and, and we could, when we have him on the pod again one day, we'll, right. we'll ask him about it. But he remembers he couldn't beat this guy, and he said to himself, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. He could have milked it for at least two more years in this league. Could have been a three right. or four sack guy, right? Yeah. That's not Warren Sapp. He had a standard and he knew yeah. uh, what he needed to do. I want to go back to Leroy real quick. And again, sure. I, I know you were unfortunately didn't get to see Leroy play in person. I was there. Uh, I saw many of his games. I've seen every one of them on television or VHS tape or in person or whatever it is. Right. And, and, and this may be a bit of urban legend, but it's been going around since around 1979. But in a game against the Chicago Bears, the left tackle was at asked after the game, after he gave up like three sacks to Leroy Selman, um, he said he told the coach at halftime, coach, there's three things that I don't want to do ever again in this world. I don't uh, ever want to be buried alive. I don't ever want to be eaten by a shark, and I don't ever want to have to try and block Leroy Selman again. Uh, people have no idea how dominant this guy was. And, and yeah. again, he toiled in mediocrity for his first three seasons, his first in his first three seasons here in Tampa yeah. Bay because they were bad. 0-26. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was the face of a 0-26 franchise because he was right. the number one overall draft pick. But um, yeah. and again, when we talk about good guys and nice guys, uh, not a nicer guy you would ever meet than oh, Leroy yeah. Selman back in 93, in 94. Peace. I was just a no-name nobody. A lot of people say I'm still a no-name nobody, but I was a uh, a radio guy that would use my radio credentials to go watch a Buccaneer practice sometimes. And I remember being over right. at the back porch of one Buccaneer place. I don't know that the weight room was set up, but there was a concrete patio out back where we kind of stood to watch practice. And right. And I saw Leroy someone there, and I think he had just been named like the associate athletic director at USF for something yes. like that. And, yeah. and I was so nervous, but I was like, man, I don't, I don't know anything about Warren. I mean, I just – about Leroy other than, than you know, what I saw on television. Was I, great man, man, right. I stopped and, uh, and asked if I could have just a couple minutes. And back then, Scott, we had those big, huge, full-size tape recorders. It wasn't like these little right. mini digital MP3 yeah. things. But I remember uh, asking if I could talk to him for a second. And – 20 minutes later went by and he still, he talked to me like I was Hubert Mizell or Tom McEwen. That's just yeah. the class guy that Leroy Selman was. No and uh, he was a guy that worked in the bank in the off season back in the day, Scott. He worked for yeah. Barnett Bank, which was around back that. then. I mean, he had a career in the off season preparing for life after yeah. football. It just died oh, way man. too I soon. Mean, it, just, a, just a tragic situation, but just an impact he made on this community. They don't name freeways after you guys unless you're a pretty damn good community ambassador yeah. like Leroy well, Selman I mean, was. And it, it's a tribute to how stingy Hugh Culverhouse was that he was a, a first-round draft pick, but yet he's still <laughs> I had to go out and, and work <laughs> and work in the, in the off season, season at, at a bank to make <laughs> That's money. That's funny. Yeah, but um, yeah. The, the thing with Leroy is is uh, five sacks his rookie season, eleven sacks in 1977, and 14 games. Right. I mean, this guy was an instant right. impact player, and um, just unfortunate a back injury. 1984, the Pro Bowl. Uh, in disc, an injury that guys recover from all the time now. But now, let's not yeah. forget, in 1984, right. if you suffered an ACL injury, your career was usually yeah, done. Was over. Yeah, Same thing right. with herniated disc, things right. that medical technology is caught up to. Leroy could have played another four or five years yes. probably if yeah. he was playing in this era yeah. based on medical Forgot technology. But but you know what? He had prepared for life after football. And and it right. wasn't the only thing in his life. And yeah. it's a lot of football players, when their career ends, yeah. they have no and idea what they're going to do. <laughs> yes, and he did. Work in the financial sector, but USF right. came calling and said, hey, right. we want to start a football program. And yeah. we think you're the guy to help usher that in. And he yeah. did and hired Jim Levitt and, uh, and often running with the USF Bulls out of the gate. So... Yep. Funny, uh, we're, I was talking about texting with Warren, and um, 
So he texted me the other day, and he's like, who, "He's like, who's number one? I know the I know the three, right? Because we did these stories three right. at a time over ten days." And uh, and I I said you, and he says, "I do love you," <laughs> and I said, I'm, "I'm just stating facts." He's like, "You're gonna get cussed out." And I said, "I'm just stating facts." He's like, "Facts are stubborn." things but so are many buccaneer fans i said no, that is a fact <laughs> that is a fact and and warren said uh, and we both know i'm not their favorite um i'm glad you're saying it not me right in terms of you know right. the top three and i i replied to warren and i said every bucks fan loved you on sunday now monday through saturday yeah. some could take you or some could leave you you know and <laughs> sap replied with a laugh out loud and true <laughs> he, he said get him sap on sunday or monday suck it sap the rest of the week <laughs> <laughs> so and he said and i still don't he said i didn't care and i still don't care so that's that's why i yeah. love warren sap is is yep. uh um you know th th there's no pulling punches with the guy what you see is what you get and mark yep. on sundays um we talked about hardy nickerson being the culture ch change leader mm -hmm. um an interesting, interesting thing with Hardy, and we'll wrap this up here, is Hardy was one part Warren Sapp, the the arrogance, the the nasty Warren Sapp, right? Um, one part cool, calm leader like Derek yeah. Brooks, right? Right. Another part intense, uh, passionate leader like John Lynch, right? Sure. It's interesting that Hardy had all three of those parts, and when he left, right? Um, uh, yeah. Hardy still remained in this franchise because yes. of those three different personalities. Yeah. You know, Brooks was the the Don. He was the Gotham. He was the quiet leader. You know, who right. was not the rah the rah rah guy. Lynch was a rah rah guy for the the back end of the defense. Sap was the leader up front, but he ruled the locker room with an iron fist. And the reason why Sap and Gruden like really got along well together was because Sap was the fire starter. Listen, NFL players, they want to make money, right? And and I've had dozens of them tell me it, they play a kid's game for a king's ransom, right? And mm -hmm. Sapp even said that too. Warren Sapp loved the game so much, and his football IQ was so high. He loved the game, the physicality part of it, but the strategy part of it too. And even if he didn't pay Warren Sapp, he would still play football because of the love of the game yep. and where you see that is not on Sundays, but on Wednesday, on Thursday, <laughs> on Friday, during the practice yeah. week, not in September when you're excited about the start of the season and optimistic. No, we're talking about November, December, the dog days mm -hmm. of, of all the accumulation of the hits, the tackles, the concussions, the, the aches, the pains, the injuries, when all that's accumulating, Warren Sapp was the guy that loved to go out there and practice on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. He was the fire starter. Yeah. So um, that's why he and Gruden, Gruden's a grinder too. And and that's why you saw Gruden get him those touchdowns in the hurricane backfield, right? Where, where he would call the hurricane package. Right. Sap would come out as the, as the tight end and catch those touchdown passes against Atlanta and other teams. It's because of, of the love of the game that Sap had. So I appreciate that, Robert. Thank you. It's good to be back. Voice is not hundred percent yet. And I'm still feeling the effects of Las Vegas, but um, you know we're hanging in there. But Mark, well, uh, you know that that wraps up our our top fifteen out of, out of our top thirty. We hope you guys have enjoyed the series on Peter Report. Uh, listen, in July there's not much to talk about, right? Because we're all <laughs> waiting for training camp, which starts in about two weeks. But uh, this was a fun exercise to do. Yeah, you know, uh, Scott, Mark, I want you, us to do something next year uh, in the off season, I, and we did it a few years ago when we when we made our last list. We did a uh, we did a draft right of our all time. That's right, not yes. best bucks players, but you know we did a, a yeah. round robin. I, I right. think it, was it just me and you? Or was, it was a fantasy I can't draft? Remember? Yeah, it was a fantasy yeah, yeah. draft. It was you and I and so. Trevor. You know, and, yeah, and the that's interesting right. Thing is now as our staff has expanded, right? We, yes. have, we have Matt Matera now. We've got obviously John Ledyard. We've got uh, Josh, JC. you know, uh, JC Allen, you know, yeah. on, on the staff now. Um, yeah. I think that'll it be would fun be, for next year. I think it'll yeah, be fun and, for and next offseason. It'll be different because we, you know, let's face it. When there's just three guys, you stack your teams, right? It's yeah. Like, yeah. But with five guys, it's like, you know, you, no one's like, all right, after after Donovan Smith, DeMar Dotson, Tristan Wirfs, um, Paul Gruber. You, you like, might be stuck drafting Jorge Diaz. 
You never know. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. We might have to draft Jim Pine and center, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> no, that'll be fun. But, I think uh, that'll be a real fun thing for us to do next offseason. Yeah. So, uh, uh, let's, yeah. let's plan on that. Put that on the schedule well, and, for sure. But this and, was a great series. And, and really, a lot of good feedback from people. You know, I kind of put these things in the Facebook groups and interact with our Facebook people. And and and, and, and uh, we got a lot of feedback and interaction with people on that as well. Yeah. And it's fun because it's something that we can all debate. I mean, yeah. I, I would like to say that you and I are 1,000% correct in our top 15, but there are people out there that that probably have, you know, Derek Brooks ahead of Warren Sapp or, or Leroy right. Selman ahead of, of of Derek Brooks or whatever it is. Right. But um, I think we're damn right on the money with our top 15 for sure. I agree. Speaking of right on the money, uh, our yes. good friends over at Loose Cannons, right? They've got uh, loosecannonstravel.com. Now, this is an opportunity Um and we've even had the loose cannon crew on here with John talking about this, but they've got three trips, Las Vegas, uh, no, Los uh, Angeles. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. God, Las Vegas on the brain. <laughs> still Las Vegas on your <laughs> that mind. Damn red eye. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Los Angeles, uh, the invasion of Los Angeles right there. Um, you can visit loose cannons, travel.com. They've got three amazing trips planned, uh, to, to different bucks, um, away games, you New Orleans, one of them for sure. There. Yeah. I mean, there's the New Orleans invasion right there. You can see painted plans are available. This, and th these packages include hotel stay, Friday night party, Saturday night pep rally, Sunday cater tailgame, and ticket to the game. So this is not a fly in one night, see the game, you're out of town. No, this right. is a party. This is right. This is an opportunity for you to see LA, to see New Orleans, to see Atlanta. There's the Atlanta uh, invasion right there. So, it's an opportunity for y'all to do some sightseeing. A lot of these travel places that want to, you know, have you fly in the day before the game and fly then go to the game right after the fly game, out. Yeah. yeah. And it's just not as fun. Right. When you, when you can't see the city, that's the, the that's the biggest complaint I had when we used to fly on the, on the bucks travel mark right. is, you know, we would get to green Bay or Minnesota or Arizona or San Diego back in the Four day. Or five on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. Yeah. Go to so the you hotel. have like two or three hours and then, yeah. Then you're it's bedtime, and then you're doing the game and flying out. You really didn't get to see the city. That's what's cool is you get to see the city with the loose cannons crew and four star VIP hotel, the Friday night private party, drinks, food, DJ, Saturday night pep rally, drinks, food, DJ, all inclusive tailgate on game day on Sundays, includes a game ticket. So uh, Scott, you, you and I really have drank with these out. loose cannons guys before at the Bruce Arians thing a few weeks ago. Yeah. Uh you prepare. Prepare to make sure you've got some Celsius with you. <laughs> yes. uh, probably some bare aspirin, some BC powder. Yes. Uh, you're going to yeah, enjoy yeah. yourself when you hang out with these guys. There's no question yeah. about it. And, 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 and Jason Light is already committed to showing up at the L.A. Uh, Friday night or the Saturday night get together. Yeah. So uh, if it works out, he's going to be there as well. So it's going to be an exciting time uh, with yeah. these guys. Uh, huge, huge Buccaneer fans. They know how to party. That's for sure. I'm probably a little too old for that, Scott. But uh, I can't hang for three days with them. But I can hang for one yeah. night. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Well, speaking of exciting, this was exciting to be back to talk about this list with you, Mark. Uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in. When we went a little long in this, that's fine. So, you know, we're at the hour and 20 minute mark, but that was fine because this is, this was a, a top it's 15 important. list that, that deserved the recognition, yes. the time, and all these. And it's fun to see a mix of new Buccaneers like a Tom Brady, newer Buccaneers like Levante David and Mike Evans. And then some absolute legends on this list from yesterday, yeah. yesteryear that uh, you and I grew up, you know, um, covering. It's like, you know, I tell people, you know, this is year 26 for me. I started in 95. I walked in the building with with Sapp and Brooks. And, you know, who knew that this franchise would, would ever turn this thing around? And yeah. not just that, but have two Super Bowls. And, oh, and by the way, have the greatest quarterback of all time, you know, um, uh, in, engineering, you know, round two for the Bucs. I mean, that's that's amazing. But that's what happened. And, uh we appreciate everybody tuning into the Peter Report podcast. The voice is going, so it's time for me to go. But make sure you stop by tomorrow, 4 o'clock, with uh, Tristan Wirfs, Buccaneers right tackle extraordinaire. Be on with Mark and either myself or John, depending on our schedules. But uh, be sure to tune into that uh, tomorrow. Mark, you want to take us out? 
Yep. We appreciate everybody that listened in again. Make sure as Scott said four o'clock tomorrow, Tristan works. We're going to talk to him about the Super Bowl season. We're going to talk to him about his off season training, and we're going to look ahead to, uh, to, to the 2021 season with Tristan works. We're going to have him on for at least 30 minutes. I actually spoke to him today. He's excited to be on, uh, to interact with Buccaneer fans. So bring some questions. We'll try and uh, throw those in as well. And then on Thursday, uh, it'll be, uh, I'm, we don't think, John has it completely lined up what he's doing Thursday, but there will be a podcast again on Thursday as well. So we appreciate everybody listening and tuning in. We thank all of our sponsors and uh, glad Scott's back as well. We'll be back tomorrow at four o'clock on the Pewter Report podcast. Out. Out.